a, a growing number of people are recognizing recognizing the threat and recognizing the danger. However, if you think about what it would take to to derail this, the the, the train track that we seem to have laid, it would take both parties recognizing the threat and and coming together to to correct that threat. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of evidence that that is happening. Welcome to Deep Dive with me, Sean Fettig. I'm a political scientist and I'm interested in trust, how our governments and politicians can gain our trust and how they lose it, but also how our personal stories can build trust and bind us together. So this space is dedicated to diving deeper into issues that are interesting, at least to me and hopefully to you, and that maybe we aren't always sure how to talk about. Over the next two weeks, I'm focusing on the rise of political violence and extremism in American society and politics. The violence at the United States Capitol on January 6th, 2021, the insurrection, the destruction, felt like the culmination of a particularly dangerous period of time in America's history. The conversations I have today and next week highlight a couple of important things. First, political violence and extremism is not new to American politics. But two, this brand of extremism and violence we are experiencing today is particularly threatening to the foundation, the core of our democracy, and it may just be the beginning. Today, I'm talking to Dr. James Hawden, a professor and the director of the Center for Peace Studies and Violence Prevention at Virginia Tech. Dr. Hawden is an expert, having published extensively, including countless academic articles and eight books on how communities respond to violence and crime, as well as how online communities can be fertile ground for the development and proliferation of online extremism. And next week, I'll be talking to Jason Van Tatenhove. Jason is the founder of the Colorado Switchblade, an online counterculture magazine. He is also a former employee of the right-wing extremist organization, The Oath Keepers, an organization that was present and active at the Capitol on January 6th. Let's do a deep dive. Dr. Hodden, thank you for being here. What do you consider to be the biggest like threats to domestic peace in the United States today? Oh, I think that's uh, clearly uh, right wing extremism is the is the biggest threat uh, today. Uh, there, you know, there's a whole brand of a range of extremism out on the internet. But the, what we see in our data is that the majority of this, at least now, is coming from the right wing, from white supremacists, from uh, hyper nationalists, from anti immigrant groups. So today, this has been uh, this is the biggest threat, and, and of course, the FBI has recognized this. The threat from radical Islamists is is still there, but it is not nearly as high as it was. And relative to the right wing extremism, it's much lower. So, Uh, for I think maybe obvious purposes, this has become politicized in that you know right wing extremism. And right wing groups are associated with, we're probably much more aligned with the Republican Party, whereas um, you know other groups like let's say Black Lives Matter and Atifa are supposedly aligned with Democrats. And so you've heard in the past year or so, Republicans say that right wing extremism can't be studied in a silo; that it needs to be studied in concert with you know extremism associated with Black Lives Matter uh, and Antifa. And I'm wondering if you think this is just a political red herring or if there's something to that? Well, I think, I think there is something to the, um, 
the claim that you cannot study one form of extremism in a in a vacuum, really, that you you have to understand the uh, whole range of extremism that's out there, and and indeed there is there is left wing extremism. There has always been left wing extremism. There is in other forms of extremism, you know, single issue extremism, religious extremism, et cetera. So I do think you have to be aware of all of it and to to understand that these groups are often in a in a dance with one another, if you will, and uh, they are in response to each other. So in that sense, I think it's true that you have to be aware of all of them, study it, it all as a as an ecoscape, right? However, there there is there is a, a difference, I think, the extent to which the mainstream Republican Party has courted or at least played nice with, if you will, a uh, right wing extremism differently than how the Democrats have played with, say, Antifa. So I do think that it's, uh, there is a difference there. I think that right-wing extremism has been kind of more embraced by the mainstream, more so than the extreme positions of the left uh, has been by mainstream Democrats. Do you think that's a relatively new thing? And the reason I ask is because to an outsider, perhaps just kind of ancillarily paying attention to this, I'll just say rise of extremism, although, you know, maybe it's wrong to characterize it as a rise, but let's say to an outsider, it seems as if the mainstream Republican Party always had this kind of, you know, wink and nod, but verbally disassociating itself with right-wing extremist groups. And it seems that that has become more overt, that it's become much more of a kind of overt embrace of right-wing extremism. Do you think that's fair? I, I do think it's fair. I think that um, right-wing, well, okay, so, so I guess we should need to put it in historic context, mm-hmm. right? The, uh, if we go back to, you say, the 1920s, White su- supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, nativism, et cetera, et cetera, was definitely embraced by mainstream uh, politics at, at that time. It was largely the Democratic Party, mm-hmm. but that 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 subsided. That became unpopular, became untenable. It became politically liable to be associated with with this type of extreme extremism and uh, you know this rhetoric of exclusion and that does not mean that it never it, it went totally away it just became a political liability so like as you said you know it became a wink and a nod and uh, the use of dog whistles and things of this nature mm-hmm. but i do think more recently i think there has been an emboldening of right wing extremism and some of this has played well enough to be uh, to lead to people being elected and uh where the the it's no longer dog whistles it's pretty explicit uh some of the some of the claims being made so so i do think that in recent times there ha- it has become more more embraced and more open. You're less likely to hear the dog whistle and more likely to just hear the outright, you know, claim of, of let's trying to hide it. Let's trying to hide your, your true feelings. And I guess that, um, that makes me wonder what kind of an impact that has on the, the form that extremism takes. What I mean is I think, when we examine this through a historical context, we didn't have things like the internet. And at least in the last, you know, 40-ish years or so, you know, we were living in an environment where there was this more, you know, the, uh, you know, signaling from politicians was more of the, you know, the wink and the nod and much less of the overt embracing. And I could imagine 
that kept a lid on the most violent forms of extremism to some degree. But what I feel like it might be doing now, you know, this more kind of overt embracing of it is it's creating a sandbox in which what used to be disparate and isolated incidents can now become like a cohesive or coordinated action. And I guess the most, you know, we could, we could layer, you know, the January 6th insurrectionist attack onto that. And I don't know if that's, you would consider that to be uni- a unique incident, an outlier, or if that is, you know, that portends kind of what, you know, a baseline now of what we can expect. Yeah, so that that's somewhat of a complicated question, right? The mm-hmm. Because, you know, it, it's, of course, difficult to, uh, you know, to say, to say that we are more, you know, embracing more political violence or more extremism than we did, say, in the 1850s and the 1860s, when mm-hmm. you know, we were actively shooting at each other. And, and of course, during the late 60s, early 70s, there, there was far more political violence, uh, f- far more acts of terrorism. You know, acts of terrorism in this country, domestic terrorism, is, is way down when you compare to that era. So in that sense, you know, I don't want to overstate the case. However, I do think it's, it's a little different. Because certainly, if you think about the sixties and seventies, the it, it, at that time the violence was coming from the political left. Mm-hmm. But the the two mainstream parties both denounced it. The Democrats may have, or the progressive wing of the Democrats at the time may have had some sympathies for some of the the claims being made by the. The radical left, but they certainly weren't embracing uh, this notion of overthrowing the government. Mm-hmm. What we're seeing today is a, is a little different and somewhat more similar to what we saw in the the 1850s, where you have parts of the existing government, you know, questioning questioning the legitimacy of that very system, and. You know, in in their eyes, they are standing up to protect that system. Of course, in their opponents' eyes, they're they're seen as insurrectionists and mm-hmm. and trying to overthrow that system. So, it is a little different than what we have experienced for a very long time. And in that sense, it's it's quite, I think, quite dangerous. I mean, if you think about January sixth. And imagine that that happened by some people who were the primary drivers of it were some foreign group mm-hmm. or even some some really fringe uh, domestic group, you know, like the Symbolese Liberation Army was in the, in the 1970s or something like that. We undoubtedly would have a bipartisan commission who was looking into this and then advocating for charges of um, sedition and and a hard com- you know response to this from the Department of Justice, from the FBI, et cetera. But what we're seeing, of course, is that one of the political bodies is involved today. I think that is the Republican Party mm-hmm. is questioning whether or not this is necessary, whether this this investigation is necessary. And if not openly embracing the the insurrection, at least kind of tacitly acknowledging that it may have been a legitimate expression of political difference. So, So I think it definitely is different than certainly what we saw in the in the 60s and 70s probably more along the lines of what we saw in the 50, 1850s and 1860s you know it does seem that you know as if our political parties and particularly the republican party although i don't think it's just them but the political parties within government have been at you know what i guess i could term you know, like maybe a civil war with each other for about maybe 30 years maybe a bit more with this like increasing 
political violence in the form of the destruction of congeniality and institutional respect, all committed in the name of like politics and governing. And we've seen that uh, kind of manifest in erosions of bargaining within government or negotiation a- a- across the aisle. And examples might be you know, denying Obama the right to appoint a Supreme Court justice under dubious, you know, with dubious reasons, you know, fast tracking Amy Coney Barrett's nomination through the Senate in record time just before an election. And then, as you just mentioned, you know, like refusing to participate in the January 6th commission. And I guess when you say that this is this is perhaps more comparative to the 1850s, 1860s than it is the 1960s, and 1970s, it begs the question then, is it at our own peril if we consider this or see this through the lens of just politics? Uh, or should we actually see this through the lens of potential violence? Oh, I think we we need to be aware of the potential for violence. I think I think you're right. I think this has been going on for some time, and it's been undoubtedly seems to have gotten worse. And I I also agree that you know it's it's I do not want to uh, say that the Democrats haven't played ball here because they they have. We, of course, have a two-party system. Um, many of the nation's founders warned against partisanship and, and party systems. And, and we have seemed to have happened in the last 40 years or so is that, that people have figured out, people being politicians, have figured out really how to game the winner-takes-all system and have done so to the detriment of the ability to to work together and you know where we now see any win by the democrats right is seen as not not a win for the country it's a win for the democrats or a win for the mm-hmm. republicans is a win for the Repu- it's not a win for the country and mm-hmm. We, of course, have always had that to some extent, but it does seem to me that this has been amplified in the last 40 years at the detriment of government working. And indeed, if you think about it, we have had both sides question the legitimacy of the process more often in the last you know, 20 years than I certainly remember. Prior to that, you know, dating back to the 2000 election and the Supreme Court's intervention in in that election, and Democrats pointing to irregularly irregularities in that election, and obviously the 2020 election has been the legitimacy of that has been called into question by by one of the you know by the losing party and. And, you know, we we heard allegations of this in 2016. Uh, We've certainly have heard allegations that, you know, the the Electoral College uh, is obsolete and, you know, in and of itself anti-democratic. And, you know, so so we're seeing the legitimacy of the very system of itself being questioned. And I. Ironically, by those people in power, you know, there's always been people who have, you know, not liked the government and have questioned the legitimacy of the government. But usually the ones who are occupying the position of government try to support it and try to um, buttress its legitimacy. So anytime that happens, once legitimacy in a system starts to erode, right, there, there's there's three types of power. There's, you know, force, economic, and ideological. And the legitimacy of the system is solely, but really based on ideological power. Us all agreeing that this system is fair and that we are going to live by its rules. Once that breaks down, you know, we, we resort to other forms of power. And one of those, and, and indeed the most immediate and effective is is violence. And, you know, I don't care how good your ideas are. If I'm willing to use a gun and and shoot you, I win. Mm -hmm. I want to follow this line, but use this next question as a segue, I think, to more specifically your research, because you're touching on something that I find really fascinating. And that is, first, I wonder if 
yes, the you know Democratic Party questioned legitimacy of the election in 2016 because of these kind of institutional challenges that I think caused Democrats more grievance than they do Republicans. And here I'm talking about like apportionment in the Senate, gerrymandering in the House, you know, the Electoral College seem to increasingly contemporarily conspire to keep Democrats in the minority, despite receiving more votes than Republicans, at least at the federal level, or at least rep- or, or representing more people, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and I guess the classic cases here, you know, Montana's two senators versus, you know, California's two senators. Sure. But what I find fascinating is what you would almost expect in a situation like that is that you would see more. So the out group here would be the Democrats, right? They're the ones that probably have more of a grievance when it comes to the institutional fairness of elections. And I, you would expect then that you would see more left-wing extremism on the rise when in fact you see more right-wing extremism. And I'm wondering, one, if that's correct. I think we've established that it is. But what your thoughts on are why? What is the grievance that the far right has? Why would we be seeing more of that now when they seem to be favored institutionally? Uh, right. Yeah. So, so first of all, I think, I think you're absolutely right in your assertions and analysis of the system. It's, um, the, the Republican party has basically has learned how to take advantage of how the system is set up to, to benefit them. And just to, you know, talk about like the two, two senators from Wyoming and two senators from California. I mean, that you can make the argument, okay, that that house is supposed to protect small states. But if that's the case, then shouldn't California have, uh, you know, something like 65 times as many House of Representatives than Wyoming does, right? And it, and of course it doesn't, um, or in 65 times the vote of Wyoming in terms of the electoral college and, uh, you know, because their population is, almost 69 times that of Wyoming. So, mm-hmm. so even, even within that system, right, that it was set up to protect small states against big state tyranny, if you will, the house that we have that was supposed to protect the population is, is out of whack. So, so anyhow, that you're, I think you're absolutely right. But to get to your question, what the grievance from the I think we are not really in a battle for political gain, if you will. The people on the right are not necessarily seen as the political power is being taken away. This is a culture war. And again, we we need to really analyze this in terms of what what type of power is at stake. This I think is is more different today than it has been in the past. If you think about in the 1960s and 70s, the grievance was, re- it was really anti-capitalistic. It was anti-modernization, uh, which of course is tied to capitalism. The anti-government sentiments were st- you know, stemming from anti-war sentiments and things of this nature. And the, the, the grievance was they wanted access to the political power or to overthrow the economic system. Even if you think about the 1850s and 1860s, I mean, obviously slavery was at the heart of that grievance, but slavery was also, it it was the economic system. It was obviously based on white supremacy and there was a, a cultural dimension to it, but there was the claim that were being made was that, you know, we want, we being the Southern states, the successionist states, want our own territory to maintain our own economic system that is based on slavery, and um, which obviously is race-based. But there was economic and, and political power tied in with this cultural power. Today, the battle really is cultural. It's really about the uh, issues of status. And if you think about throughout much of human history, if not all of human history, there are two fundamental values that we 
we have always embraced. And one is, you know, diversity and one is purity. And both of which have their virtue, uh, right? Diversity, you know, variety is the spice of life. But on the other hand, you know, we, we like purity, right? We want purity in our food. We want purity in our water. We want purity in the intentions of the people who are courting us. And uh, so, you know, we, we have these two cultural values that are embraced and deeply woven into, into our society. And historically, if, you, if we go back prior to, say, the, the, the success of the civil rights movement, our system largely embraced and enforced purity. We always, we always have a, a warm spot in our heart, if you will, for diversity, right? Give us our huddle masses, et cetera. But we really like that diversity to be a little less diverse than, you know, when it got too diverse, we, of course, you know, passed laws to exclude people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about our laws, our laws were emphasizing, you were largely in place to kind of protect the status quo. And that status quo, of course, was, was with, you know, white, largely Protestant, largely males in positions of power. Since that time, right, since the, 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 the 60s and 70s and certainly more recently, that culture has shifted. That the culture is, we are now far more embracing of the notion of diversity. And, you know, it is undeniable that women have made tremendous gains. Um, Ethnic minorities have made gains. Uh, people of, of non-traditional lifestyle, right? uh, you know, non-cisgendered uh, and various sexual orientations are far more acceptable. We are far more pluralistic today than we were in the past, culturally speaking. And so I think where the backlash against uh, against you know coming from the extreme right is is about that it's not about political power now of course they want political power so they can again enforce norms of purity if you will rather than norms of diversity but where their grievance is is that the culture their culture is being being attacked and being eroded and you know To be sure, diversity, you know, as I said, we are far more pluralistic. Of course, those on the the side, the champions of diversity will will point out that, yeah, well, we got a lot. We we have a long way to go before economic power and political power is is equalized in this country and opportunities for those are equalized in this country. And that's undoubtedly true. But it's not about politics and economics. It's more about the culture. It's more about status. And the problem with battles of status is that status is inexpansible uh, in the sense that, you know, if if everyone wins a Nobel Prize, they're pretty meaningless. Right? They're meaningful because we give so few of them out. Mm-hmm. So s- status is being inexpansible. It's hard to find a compromise. You know, you can compromise with economic power. I can, I can give you a slice of my pie to bring hostilities to an end. You can compromise with political power. I can, I can expand your access to the system. Status, if I say you are right, then to that, the extent to which you are right means that I am wrong. And that is a, a difficult, difficult pill to make people swallow. This sounds very stark in a way, because, I mean, just as you said, if the point is access to political level, levers of power, then we have blueprints. You know, we know how to mitigate and alleviate some of the grievance, right? Via, you know, as you said, compromise. But if this is not about like primarily access to political levels of power, then we're we're really talking about absolute power. And in that sense, I guess the question is like, what's the end game? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's the scary question, right? That uh, we know the end game 
from history what what happens when when one party gets control of all the power, right? All the the political and the economic power, and starts to enforce their vision of the cultural power, right? When statuses are are recognized as uh, uh, valuable and and right when that starts being enforced by the the butt of a gun, things things tend to get very ugly. And I do fear that we could be on could be on that path. Again, I don't want to be an alarmist. I think that uh, mm-hmm. a, a growing number of people are recognizing recognizing the threat, recognizing the danger. However, if you think about what it would take to to derail this, the, the the train track that we seem to have laid, it would take both parties recognizing the threat and and coming together to to correct that threat. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of evidence that that is happening. So let's dig a little bit into that. You know, this potential for solutions. It's it's so common at this point that it's almost a trope that whenever we have like, you know, high profile incidents of violence in the United States, the th- same things receive blame, right? Like violence on TV or in movies, violent video games, maybe absence of religion in childhood, maybe even absence of a two-parent home. And I know that in your research, you argued that in some cases, these outlets like video games can actually be positive avenues to release aggression. I I imagine this could be controversial for some people. And I'm wondering if you could, one, talk more about this. What do you mean by that? And what, what does, what's the form that that takes? And then if that's true, then can we draw on that to identify some solutions that could have a practical impact on policy to reduce this kind of proliferation of extremism? Yeah, well, to be sure, you know, the, the argument about violent movies, violent video games, violent music you know, leading to violence. I, I do think that people are pretty adept at, at being able to separate fantasy from reality. And uh, and Lord knows that if watching violent movies and such made one violent, that we our murder rates would be far higher than they are. There certainly is enough violent entertainment out there to, to if indeed that was a primary trigger that we would be you know far more violent than we are however with that said i i mean i do think that norms are are important right norms and about acceptability of behavior are important and while i think that you know a, a young kid could be sitting there playing say an active shooter game and be sophisticated enough and, and smart enough to realize that, you know, killing is not divine, killing is wrong. But it really, I think it does, there is something about why that killing is happening, right? What what kind of norms are we setting in terms of the justifications for violence, right? And some movies, some video games, et cetera, are the the violence is is moralistic. It's it's righteous, right? It's revenging a wrong. It's um, standing standing one's ground for you know a clear injustice that was was lodged against you, right? And that that's one thing. It's another thing when you know the norms are for that are being defended by the violence are like you know liquidating your enemy and this enemy is some you know group other than space aliens um and when this the group you know if you think about some of the the games out there that you know are about being on the on the border and shooting immigrants and things of this nature and you know when I think that is those types of norms are are promoted and 
you know, just normalized, that breeds a or, or makes a more fertile ground for the planting of the seeds of extremism and, and hate. So I think we, we need to be nuanced in when we're talking about the effect of these things. And, and I think that the effect is, is, it's certainly not a hypodermic needle, right? It's not that, you know, you get shot up with a violent video game shot and then you run out and kill somebody. But I think over, you know, the, in some circles, especially given the way the internet works, where fringe elements can be kind of pulled off and and these norms amplified and reinforced time after time after time after time, that becomes dangerous, right? That becomes where extremism flourishes. To combat that, right, I think that we we need to really rethink some of the ways that uh, service providers have these games and movies and such. Right? We shouldn't only be fed things that we agree with. That tends to polarize people. That tends to to break people into smaller and smaller tribes. So we need to be fed things that that cross fertilize and ideas and and tribes, if you will. Violence in video games and violence in movies and, you know, ingestion of these things seems to cut across like racial and ethnic lines. And yet organized online extremism seems to be limited to young white men. So it seems to almost be exclusively a young white male problem. And I could be wrong, but there must be some other organizing factor here. And so one, I wonder if you agree uh, and two, what those other factors might be. Yeah, I I do agree, although I do caution to not overstate the correlation. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, our research does show that young white males are disproportionately involved in this, but it, that, that, that correlation might not be as strong as, as people think. Hmm. But but where where I think the issue is, is, is again, in the ability... And, and this is this is something, and you know, not to be the type to just jump on. Oh, you know, the the internet has worked, ruined the world, uh, bandwagon. But uh, mm-hmm. it does allow for like-minded people to reach uh, and connect with each other, and to cordon themselves off from from other groups and and right if we if you think about an analogy with with offline terrorism and we know from studying uh say suicide bombers right that as these people are are you know preparing to to enact their violence right they are separated from pretty much everybody right they are kept away from family they are kept away from Everyone except for a very small group of people who who are able to reinforce that what you are about to do, you know, giving your life for the cause is a noble thing. Mm -hmm. And it protects people, uh, outsiders who look at this and say, are you insane? Are you crazy? What, you know, nothing is worth this and certainly not this cause. It stops them from from breaking in. So and if we think about the. What the internet allows these online communities of largely, say, young white men who can go off by themselves, if you will, you know, in in virtual space, and uh, and as you limit your interactions to one group of people, the homogeneity of ideas among that group becomes stronger. Mm-hmm. And the difference between that and the broader group becomes more pronounced, right? So, so it is a recipe for extremism. It's a recipe for being, you know, so you get, you're basically sitting around saying, well, of course, everybody thinks like I do because everybody I interact with online thinks like I do. 
all of the stuff that I'm seeing and, you know, the news feeds that I'm seeing are all, you know, supporting this and I'm not seeing any contrary evidence. So I must be correct. And, you know, and again, to com- contrast that with, say, in the 1970s, there were undoubtedly school children sitting around thinking, I want to shoot up my school because I hate you know, whatever group I hate, all the kids picking on me, or I just want to shoot people or whatever. Who would you talk to about that? But you're, you know, probably your friends and your chances are your friend went to the same school that you're talking about shooting up. And that friend would say, dude, are you crazy? Well, now you go online and you post this and somebody in, you know, from across the country goes on and says, yeah, you're right. You should do it. And so I, I do think it's a it's a more dangerous environment, and it's an environment that allows for fringe groups to isolate themselves and therefore become more amplified. I wonder how much of this clarity is situated in 2020 hindsight, because I feel like, you know, when we were becoming aware of the the social, economic, political, cultural force that the internet could be, you know, like late 90s, early 2000s, there was a maybe outsized amount of attention that was given to the role that it could play in democratizing, connecting marginalized communities you know, around the world, um, not just the country, you know, and giving more voice and power and allowing that to be a new fertile ground for like homegrown kind of political activism. and. I think this is true, but something that didn't seem to receive as much attention, at least at the time, was that this would also be connecting communities that had less benign intent, you know, like far right extremist groups, insurrectionists, et cetera. I'm wondering if you agree and were we caught flat footed? Of course, the one of the fundamental reasons the internet was developed, of course, was to promote democracy, right? And and indeed, the dark net, you know, the the under uh, the Tor router and, and, you know, was developed by the U.S. government to indeed encourage insurrections. So it has always been kind of meant to give power to the powerless, to avoid undue surveillance by repressive regimes and that was always recognized and and indeed celebrated. What I think caught us flat-footed was that we didn't envision that the insurrectionists would be here, right? It, we didn't mm-hmm. envision, um, oh, they want to overthrow our government, right? That, uh, but of course, one person's insurrection is another person's fight for freedom. It's a, It's an ugly... Truth, if you will, right? That that democracy is based on everybody having a say, mm-hmm. and you know we we need the powerful as well as the powerless to be able to express their voice. But of course, everyone who has a voice doesn't necessarily have a good idea, right? And just because you are in power doesn't necessarily mean your ideas are good. And just because you're out of power doesn't necessarily mean your ideas are good, right? And democracy, the process democracy is really about that debate of ideas. And, you know, the idea is that the may the best idea be selected uh, through a fair and open process. Now, of course, the majority doesn't always get it right, but if there, if the procedure is fair, right? If there is the legitimacy and a sense of procedural justice, if you will, that my my idea had its day, my idea was debated, it was put up to a fair vote, and it lost, then okay, we. We need to move on. We need to accept that, okay, my idea did not win in the marketplace and uh, politic of ideas. What scares me is that procedural, that the procedure, that very procedure of democracy is being 
the legitimacy of it is being questioned. When you know the ideas are being sold to the highest bidder, those are the ones that win, which of course has a long history in our country, but you know, people people see that when when voices are being unfairly marginalized and, and sidelined and not heard. And then when the actual process of we get to vote on which ideas win, when that starts being questioned, the legitimacy of that starts being questioned, it it's not a recipe for civil society to flourish. In that vein, then, it does seem as if we've past a critical tipping point at which tangible things could be done to kind of right this ship. And by that, I mean remedies that are often offered as things that we could do, things that we could reinvest in as a country to kind of shore up our democratic ideals. So like ensuring access to the vote and a social safety net that benefits everyone. Um, and then you know reinvesting in things like civics education and more collegiality in our politics. But that really does require a bipartisanship and a moderation on the part of politicians that I just don't think we have anymore. And I guess I'm just wondering, and I don't, I, I know I'm asking you to perhaps be an alarmist here, but I, my question is, are we maybe already too far gone? Uh, my kind of gut reaction is to be an alarmist and say yes, but uh, hope trying to be hopeful. I do think there are some concrete things that could be done in I'm not sure they will be, but there mm-hmm. could be, right? That so our politicians, you're you're absolutely right. For for widespread change to to really be enacted, it's going to take bipartisanism, and as long as we reward partisanism politically, that's going to continue and it's going to get worse, right? And if you know, if you think about the way that the the house is set up now with the gerrymandered districts, that you know, in a highly gerrymandered district, you're never going to lose to somebody in the opposition party. You're going to lose to somebody mm-hmm. who's crazier than you from your own party. Mm-hmm. So, so we we need to 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 fix that, right? But the only way that's going to happen is if the if the people demand it to happen, right? And so we have to stop rewarding politicians for their bad behavior. I don't necessarily foresee that happening, but I think that that, that is, that is, you know, what needs to happen. You know, one thing that I think could help, we need to, I think one of the problems that is fueled this partisanism and indeed lethal partisanism, and you know, that if you look at the numbers of people who say that Violence against those who politically di- they disagree with is acceptable, is, is alarming, right? This has is, is really mm-hmm. become alarming. But one of the things I think that fuels it is, you know, when we got rid of the fairness doctrine back in the 80s, it, the fairness doctrine, of course, what it, tr- it tried to do was to, if, there, if uh, media sources were going to talk about controversial issues, they were supposed to present both sides. Mm-hmm. And that was overturned. And then when reform was proposed, the Reagan administration, Reagan vetoed it. And so the fairness doctrine went away. And what this coupled that with the 24 hour news cycle. And now if you watch the news today, and it doesn't matter what news channel you pick, half of the show, but more than half of the show is editorializing. We, we no longer get the news in the sense of, on Friday, uh, this event happened. There were 27 people hurt, and the police are investigating. Right? No editorializing. Just this is what happened. We don't see that very much anymore. And and, and instead, you know, that we have talking heads telling us how we're supposed to think about it. And this editorializing, right? Of course, gets into partisanship and. This just tends to amplify the extremes. If you look at the American public, we are not nearly as as extreme as our politics make us out to be, right? Mm -hmm. There is overwhelming agreement on most issues. But if you would listen to our politicians, of course, the 
the ones who get the news, the ones who make the headlines are the extremes. And, and of course, if you think about the way the internet works, right? We, we live on clickbait. My moral outrage is likely to get a thumbs up, is likely to be retweeted, is likely to be, you know, when, why, why am I so outraged about this? You know, mm-hmm. can't we have a conversation about it rather than me screaming at you? And so I do think the way to a more civil social discourse is really dependent upon our our parochial realm, if you will, our businesses, our communities, our our religious institutions, our schools. You know, having a the ability to talk about an issue. You know, somebody out there, some news organization, would just going to report what happened without telling you that this is a good or a bad thing. Hmm. You know, it's the community the, of voters uh, standing up and saying. You know, we want compromise. We do not want this these extreme positions to be codified into law. Until that happens, the political system, as it's currently is set up, rewards extremism and uh, partisanism. And unfortunately, if we don't step up and you know vote out those who are advocating for this and willing to exploit that system, it's just going to continue Hmm. the way it's been. What have you been reading or watching that's been particularly interesting to you lately? And it doesn't have to be related to this topic. Yeah, well, it kind of is related to this. I've been been really fascinating, fascinated looking at examples from our history where the government worked. Right, where we actually were able to take on a problem head on and and implement policies that you know were were effective uh that did did bring about change you know I've been reading for example about the dust bowl right the um some of the policies uh, implemented there and, and you know and if you think about the people who supported those policies strong government to intervention you know these were not these were not you know communist sympathizers these were pretty mm-hmm. pretty hardcore you know uh keep government out of my life you know if you think about uh what we did you know, with like the Clean Water Act, if you think about, not sure how old you are, but I remember as a kid, you know, news of rivers catching on fire. Mm. And certainly when you went to a city and you went down near the river, this is where the, the you know, warehouses were kept. And this was where if people lived there, these were people who couldn't afford to live anywhere else, right? Now you go near water and, you know, you, you need multi-millions to even have a prayer to have a water view of in most mm. major cities, right? It, well, there, there's a reason for that. It's because our water no longer stinks and kills us. It, uh, uh, so I've been, I've been fascinated about how government it, and throughout our history, there have been times where, you know, the government has very successfully taken on problems and and worked effectively. Dr. Hodden, we've run out of time. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Yep, you too. Thank you. My conversation with Dr. Hodden today helps me to understand the context of political violence and extremism in today's world as well as maybe the challenges facing not only us as citizens, but also our democratic structure. I'm not sure that this conversation helps me to feel hopeful, per se, but it does make me feel as if I understand the playing field a bit more. And that can help us to think more realistically, and also creatively, about solutions. And Dr. Hodden's suggestion that we focus just as much on what government has gotten right as we do on what it has gotten wrong might unlock stories and narratives that we've forgotten that we might be able to dust off and update in pursuit of some shared objective. But this does all make me wonder, who are these folks joining these right-wing organizations? Who's leading them? What do they want? Do we even have any common ground? And if so, what might be some ways to begin to seed that soil? 
Next week, I'm going right to the source when I'll talk to Jason Van Tatenhove, a former employee of one of these organizations, the Oath Keepers. In the meantime, as always, if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, you can email me at deepdivewithshawn at gmail.com. And you can find me on Twitter at deepdivesean and on Instagram at deepdivewithshawn. Chat soon, folks.